Okay, hello everyone. So welcome to, to this edition of ICTS Spring Seminar. I hope that everyone is doing fine and healthy. So today we have the pleasure to have Professor Kumran Bhapa and Dr. Miguel Montero from Harvard University. Uh, so this is a joint talk and they are going to tell us about the swamp land in D greater than six. So Professor Bhapa, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so it's a great pleasure to be giving a talk here. Thanks for the invitation. and. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Swampland and DVG and six, as was mentioned. This is the joint joint talk that we're going to be giving with Miguel. Uh, so uh, the work is based on a number of papers. It began in 1905 uh, paper. So this is the paper with um, uh, that we wrote with Hicho Kim and Gary Shu. Uh, a related topic is related to a paper written with Jake McNamara. Uh, having to do with the cobordism conjecture. Another paper which, was, which is relevant is the paper with uh, Hicho Kim and Huri Tarazi, my student. And uh, finally, the work that uh, is gonna be more than half of this, this talk is gonna be based on the work we just put out with Miguel uh, um, very recently. So and that's, the, that's the plan, that's the relations of the talk, the papers that relate to the talk. So, um, Quantum field theories, uh, I think we now by now feel that we have a more or less an understanding of it. It doesn't mean that we can solve everything in them, but we know what constitutes a consistent theory by and large. We also know at least the scan of them in different dimensions, as, at least as far as supersymmetric ones are concerned. So we have kind of a, a relatively solid understanding of quantum field theory, I would say. But uh, if you ask the same question about quantum field theories coupled to quantum gravity, uh, as far as the consistent ones, we know examples, for example, uh, the, the things that we construct in string landscape are examples of it, but we do not know what constitutes a gen in a general way, a quantum field theory and quantum gravity being together and consistent. In fact, it seems, and in fact, we have a lot of evidence for the statement that almost all consistent quantum field theories, when you, make, when you couple to quantum gravity becoming consistent, so quantum field theory and quantum gravity together somehow don't generally work. And uh, this, is the, this is the basic surprise. Uh, of course, it doesn't mean that there are only very few, uh, there are only like handful of uh, consistent ones. No, there's a huge number, but still compared to what it could have been, it's very, very small. So the fraction of consistent ones to, to all possible quantum field theories is, is uh, believed to be measure zero. Now these lines I'm not drawing. I'm not sure who are drawing these lines, but that's an interesting, uh, if you don't like a part of a talk, you draw a line on that part, that's a good one. <laughs> so is there a way to, to stop that? Yes, that'd be good. Um, so now there are this, the Swampland program is therefore finding conditions for quantum field theories uh, that they need to satisfy for uh, quantum field theory and quantum gravity to be consistent. Uh, yes, I'll be appreciative if Mahadevan does not draw a line on my, uh, on my slides, thank you. So easiest to start with the uh, most constraint theories. Uh, so uh, in fact, the supersymmetric theories are, are the most constrained ones. So we might as well start with supersymmetric theories and we could restrict our attention to higher dimensions because there are more restrictions in higher dimensions. So therefore it's, it seems given the difficulty of this uh, program, to start with the easiest case, an easiest case uh, seems to be considerations of quantum field, uh, supersymmetric theories in dimensions, let's say, bigger than six. So we will focus on supersymmetric theories in dimension bigger than six. We will focus on Minkowski backgrounds. We're looking for Minkowski backgrounds. And the only possibilities with Minkowski backgrounds with supersymmetry are either 32 or 16 supercharges. And uh, for dimension bigger than six. And uh, these are the, basically the two cases I'm going to discuss. In fact, the, the case of 32 supercharges, which is a maximum supersymmetric case, is kind of boring and I will try to explain why. The reason is that the, the theories with 32 supercharges have no matter content. The whole, uh, uh, the whole uh, low energy description of it is basically given by the gravity supermultiplet. So this solemn plan program is very simple for this case. It's basically boring, there's nothing to ask, except even in this case, there's something interesting we can, we can uh, take a note of. 
and that is the what I would call the string lamppost principle. The 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 question or the principle that uh, whether all consistent quantum gravities are part of the string landscape. So um, it could have been that the theories with 32 supercharges are perfectly consistent, but they are not realized in string theory, for example. But that is not the case. Uh, the fact that, in, uh, that they are realized in string theory uh, indeed gives further credence to their existence and, uh, and consistency. So uh, indeed, we know how we get theories with 32 supersymmetries. We either start with M theory in 11 dimension or its toroidal compactifications or type to be in 10 dimensions. So these, this basically is the full set of theories with 32 supercharges with Minkowski background. And uh, quite remarkably, uh, we have a complete story there. There's nothing to discuss. There's no quantum field theory. There's no additional ingredient and that's it. So we're kind of done with the 32 supersymmetry case. So the main focus therefore in this talk would be um, for theories with 16 supersymmetries in dimensions bigger than six. So uh, what are the conditions that we have uh, so far for Swampland? Uh, some of these conditions are absolutely obvious uh, that we, or at least uh, to most of us is obvious. We do want the theory to have unitarity. So unitarity is a principle I would say of Swampland. That's kind of trivial, trivially obvious. Another one which is trivially obvious is that you don't want the theory to be anomalous. You don't want the gravitational or gauge or other anomaly, so the theory should be anomaly free. So these, these kind of things, some of them are kind of obvious. And then there are some things which are less obvious. For example, cobordism conjecture states that uh, cobordism classes uh, in a quantum theory of gravity is always trivial. We'll discuss aspects of this a bit later, but that's some, some aspects that will be relevant for us. And a particular corollary of cobordism conjecture, which uh, cobordism conjecture can be viewed as uh, generalizing it, is the completeness of spectra. Again, this completeness of spectra is something uh, very kind of robust, and we believe in it. We have the various argument for it. And we take this to mean that it, in the strong form of it, that if you have a black brain BPS, the corresponding state is part of the BPS spectrum. So uh, having a black brain uh, satisfying the BPS condition, uh, uh, is, is an indication that it could be there. And in the some sense, we are saying that is part of the spectrum. The other principle that we will be using in this talk is the distance conjecture. This is conjecture uh, in the context of Swampland says that if you consider moving in the moduli space of a theory, and the theory has moduli space of light modes, uh, massless modes in the context of supersymmetric theories quite often, so if you move in such a moduli space, then, uh, then you might get light state appearing. And the basic distance conjecture says that this is unavoidable. That is, when you move in moduli space, if you go far away in moduli space, you always will get a massless modes. And more than that, the massless modes are the ingredients, uh, these light, not, new light emerging modes are the ingredients for the, um, for the new degrees of freedom that will emerge uh, for the dual description of the theory. So, so basically distance conjecture could also be viewed as duality conjecture that any theory of quantum gravity, which has moduli has a dual description along that moduli somewhere as you go away from the middle of the moduli space to the corners. We will also use this form of the distance conjecture, the assumption that infinite distance will always lead to a dual description. Now, uh, unitarity of course is a, uh, is a, uh, is a well sacred principle for us and we believe in it. Uh, and a famous example of it is in the context of black hole physics and its unitary evolution, which is still being uh, discussed and studied. It's not a trivial statement by any means, but we believe it should hold. And we should, we, it should also apply to the effective theory on all stable brains in the context of quantum gravity as well. So it is not just the unitarity uh, of a scattering of gravitons, let's say, in the bulk, but also on the unitarity of any objects within that theory. So for example, if we have a one brain, uh, a string in the theory with central charges C left and C right, we must have that these central charges are positive. And this is a unitarity condition for the, for the, uh, for the quantum field theory on the, on, the one, on the worksheet of that brain. Similarly, if we have a gauge symmetry group G, um, in the theory, it leads to a conserved global current on the brain. 
so if you assume left moving current uh, J left associated with this group and the uh, level K left related to its anomaly, we must have that K left is bigger than or equal to zero. And this comes from the WW. Uh, you can compute the central charge to obtain the famous formula that the central charge of this group is the level times the dimension over the level plus the dual Coxeter number of the group. Uh, the central charge of the group G should be less than or equal to the central charge of the full theory because the balance of the full central charge and the central charge of the current algebra should itself be a unitary system. So we get a restriction that CG is less than or equal to CL. Note that for a U1 uh, gauge symmetry, uh, this boils down to saying the central, ch central charge of a U1 current uh, uh, is one. Of course, that's not surprising because it can be realized by, by a single uh, bosonic current, del phi. So it's not surprising that the central charge of a, of a current U1 current is one. The theory should be anomaly free. And this is kind of, uh, again, uh, as I said, uh, uh, obvious, and but but we want to make we want to make a note of that it doesn't just apply to bulk theory but also to defects. So, but there there are some subtleties in the context of defects because there could be anomaly inflows. That means that the anomaly cancellation happens if you take into account the anomaly flow into the defect itself. For example, if you have a one one brain uh, with uh, with the field strength h. So if you have a one brain, if you have a, in the bulk a, a two form with the field strength H satisfying an equation, the H is uh, some constant times the Pontryagin number plus minus another constant times the trace of F for Jeff. Uh, from, this from this formula, you can read off the anomaly inflow coefficients. So it, it says that the anomaly inflow uh, implies that the central charge of the left and the right movers on that brain do not cancel. They are not equal. So C left minus C right is A. And the K left minus K right, the level of the current algebra for this group associated with the gauge symmetry that we're talking about, K left minus K right, the levels will be equal to B. So just from such an equation, we can read off the central charges and the levels uh, in this way. Gravity multiplet of n equal to, n equal to 16 theories includes a two form B field and, and a matter multiplet uh, is, uh, which is a gauge multiplet for some group G. Specifying just what the group is uh, specifies the low energy degree of freedom of the theory completely. Completeness conjecture uh, suggests that there must exist a, a, a string. That's because there's a B field. And if you look at the BPS strings, you, you find that there's a BPS brain and therefore this strong version of the completeness suggests that there's a BPS string as well. A BPS string uh, with this much supersymmetry breaks half of, in general, breaks half of the supersymmetry. So there should be at least a zero comma a supersymmetry on a sport sheet. And we would like to consider consequences of this uh, existence of this BPS string and the worksheet supersymmetry that it enjoys. Let us start with the theory with 16 supercharges in 10 dimensions. Uh, there are four known solutions to gravitational and gauge anomaly cancellations, E8 cross D8, SO32, and two other uh, uh, funny ones. You want to the 248 times E8 and you want to the 496. By the way, this is an example of an anti swamp land in the following sense, uh, as Miguel likes to point out, that uh, the gauge group itself uh, here would be anomalous because of the gauge anomalies. And so existence of the gravitation is important in making things work in this theory. So, uh, so this is an interesting example that we need combination of gravity and gauge theory for it to get a consistent feature. But we end up with things which have involved extra U1s and that we don't like, we don't see. And so the question is, what are these last two examples? We know the first two. So what about, what's wrong with the last two? Or are they realized? Are they consistent theories? If they are consistent theories and they are not realized in string theory, then the string lamp post principle would be invalidated. That means there are examples which cannot be realized in string theory. So what could be possibly wrong with the other two examples that you want to, the one which have U1? Anomaly cancellation tells you the coefficients of R with R and F with F. And if you read off, you get DH is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is combinations which I've written down over here. So the trace of R with R gives you a Pontryagin class along the tangent to the worksheet, which I denote by T2, and an orthogonal direction to the string, which is SO8. 
as a second current class of it. So there are two currents. There's a current also associated with SO8, but also there's another current associated with the gauge group itself. And from these, uh, from this formula, you can read off the the uh, anomaly coefficients for for the corresponding currents and the central charges on the worksheet of the string. In particular, uh, we learned that the the right central charge is three times kr, and one finds that. Uh, so this is the this is the um, uh, here I'm using the fact that the um, perhaps I should go back. Here I'm using that the SO8 is part of the R symmetry of the zero comma eight uh, supersymmetry algebra, and due to the relation between the central charge and the level on the supersymmetry, you can deduce from that level and the fact that you know the supersymmetry is the right mover that the C right is three times K right, and one finds that K right is four, C right is 12. And since C left minus C right is 12, from the gravitational anomaly, you learn that C left is 24. So 0, 0,8 supersymmetry leads to the fact that the current is left moving. And since uh, the CG is less than or equal to the balance of the central charge with the center of mass uh, central charge, and taking note that the central ch charge in, uh, uh, for a bosonic string, and it's for a string in uh, 10 dimensions is eight. So you learn that CG uh, is equal to, less than or equal to 24 minus eight, which is 16. In other words, the central charge of the group is better be less than or equal to 16. Uh, and uh, since the central charge of the U1 is equal to one, therefore the rank of any U1s that you might get should be bounded by 16. And therefore this rules out the last two possibilities. In fact, the first two possibilities saturate the central charge. As we know, the central charge of both E8 cross E8 and S32 at level one, which is the one realized in heterotic string, satisfies central charge of the current algebra exactly equal to 16. There's also alternative argument to rule out these last two examples. So, uh, so this basically is a verification, at least in this context of the string lamp host principle, that what seems to be consistent is part of the string landscape. Let us proceed to the theories with 16 supercharges in dimensions less than two. There are some general features that are seen in the string landscape. There are only, a, a, first of all, we only know a finite number of such theories. There's, there's a just, you can count them. Uh, sorry, uh, hello? Yes, hello, you, yes. Accept, uh, about, about the last slide. Yes. So is there a relation between these two arguments? Um, if I remember right, uh, this Adams, they will say there was a space-time argument, a target space. They were using super properties of supersymmetry, which is, there's, I don't see any direct argument, a relation between these two arguments. Okay, okay. Uh, because that did not involve any world sheet, is that right? Uh, no, no, they did not. They did not use world sheet. They used properties of supersymmetry realization. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, but, this, but, is different, uh, this is a different argument, exactly. But, but, but there also, in, in, the argument is the same that uh, there is uh, some limit on this rank. Uh, is there even some rough? Um, uh, I, I don't think they had a bound on the rank like the way we are saying. That, that's not in my impression. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so let us proceed with the, with the n equal to 16 theories in D less than 10. The general features that you see in string landscape uh, that there are only a fine number of such theories, we can count them. And moreover, the highest ranked theories in this class seem to come from simple toroidal compactification of hydraulic strings or type one strings. And they lead to the rank of the group being uh, 16, which is the rank you start in 10 dimension, plus extra uh, uh, U1s that you get by compactifying uh, uh, in the usual fashion. So you get 10 minus the extra U1s, and this gives you uh, 26 minus D as the, as, the bound, as the rank that you get for the matter theories. And so 26 minus D is the rank that you get from toroidal compactification of hydraulic string. And this seems to be the upper bound of all the known examples that there are other examples, other compactifications with 16 supercharges, but all of them have a rank less than or equal to 26 minus D. Now, we now show that this is a general feature for all these theories. We argue using some of these swampland principles that you actually can see why they cannot be ranked bigger than 26 minus D. So as I already noted, theories uh, admit PPS strings, and, uh, but supergravity in this lower dimension is not powerful enough to fix all the anomaly coefficients, unlike, unlike the 10 dimensional case. So if you write the supersymmetry, uh, if you write down the 
equation that for the DH, you find that there are two unknown coefficients, coefficient of trace of R with R and the RF with F, which we a priori don't know. So there's, the theory is not chiral anymore, so it's gonna be harder to describe, to find these coefficients from the anomaly considerations. Uh, it's impossible. And so the question is, how do we then restrict these coefficients? So there are two possible uh, infrared supersymmetries on the string, the 0, 0,8, or, or it could potentially be enhanced to 8, 8,8. Uh, sometimes this happens in the infrared to some theories. Let me just focus on the 0, 0,8 theory. The 8, 8,8 theory works in a similar way. So if you take the 0, 0,8 case and, and use the formulas for the anomaly inflow, you find that the C left is 24 kappa and C right is 12 kappa. They're both fixed by kappa because as I said, the trace of R with R gives you the level also for the SO8 R symmetry. And from the R symmetry, you can read the level of the central charge of the supersymmetry algebra to give 12 kappa. So kappa controls both the left and the right central charge. The center of mass of the, of the uh, string on the left side is, is bosonic, uh, is, is uh, not supersymmetric, so therefore it involves D minus two degrees of freedom. So there is central charge of the left movers for central mass is D minus two. And central of charge, central, uh, um, central charge for the center of mass of the right movers is 12 because of supersymmetry, you can easily count it from the free supersymmetry multiplet. And this gives you 12. So you need to learn that uh, the extra central charge on the right movers, which is the difference between 12 kappa and 12, uh, which has to be positive, Im implies that kappa is bigger than or equal to one. So we already make the deduction that kappa is bigger than or equal to one. And for the left mover central charge, we learned that the, the extra central charge is the balance of 24 kappa and D minus two. So the extra central charge is 24 kappa plus D minus two. We still don't know what kappa is. Kappa could be any number bigger than or equal to one a priori, and it, uh, we don't know what that a priori could have been. Now we use the strong form of the distance conjecture to, to bound kappa. So this is the argument. So due to the high amount of supersymmetry, the moduli space of scalars in this theory is fixed to be the same, the familiar one in Narayan space compactification. So this is a general property of the this much supersymmetry. So the moduli space is going to be described by a quotient of SOR plus D comma D divided by SOR plus D times SOD where D is the dimension we are in and R is the rank of the group. So now, uh, what, yes? role did the, what role did the gauge symmetry play in the previous slide? Sorry, here, it played yeah. no role. In, in the previous slide, I was only concentrating on trace of R with R. But uh, uh, if one has some gauge symmetry, that should also be subtracted, right? That should also contribute some central charge. Yes, so, so the, the contribution of the, go, of the current will come into what I mean by C left extra. So whatever okay. extra is, is not going to have, to, is going oh, to be accounted for by this. So we haven't used it yet, but I'll come to using it. Okay, thank you. So due to the high amount of supersymmetry, the moduli space is, is, is an Orion one. And when you compact, so suppose you take this theory and compactify this theory in the D dimension to one lower dimension on a circle. It is easy to use supergravity to argue that the moduli space, if you don't turn on any Wilson lines, is simply given by what you had already plus the radius of the circle, which is given by SO11 with R. In other words, it's a trivial uh, moduli space, you just get an extra radius, which is the, you can view it as a boost parameter of the SO11 group. Uh, now the strong form of the distance conjecture tells us that as R goes to zero, if you take this circle of large radius and try shrinking it, as R goes to zero, we should get a dual description. That is because R goes to zero is infinite distance in the physical units in the, in the R field. And therefore we should get, a, according to the distance conjecture, the strong form of it, we should have a weakly coupled theory. This weakly coupled theory must have 16 supercharges. And it, given the fact that it has already the Narayan form, it already tells you it's at least d-dimensional and therefore it must exactly be d-dimensional. And therefore as d goes to zero, we must get a theory with 16 such supercharges with d-dimensions. And so T duality should be generally true. So with this much supersymmetry, T duality is a consequence of the distance conjecture. We don't have to assume any particular dual theory. We don't know what it is. We don't know exactly which dual emerges, but this says the dual should be there. The strings wound on the circle would be the lightest string of the theory as R goes to zero. So you start with a string, which is, you start with a large circle and you wind a, 
the B minor field has a BPS string, you wrap this string around it, and you look at the, you look at the lightest states on this string. In the limit as the radius goes to zero, the supersymmetry algebra implies that the, the mass of the state of the corresponding theory in this one lower dimensional theory goes to zero. So we get light states, arbitrary light states, but we know that they cannot have any spin more than two because we, want to, we know that we're getting a dual theory of, of uh, gravity and therefore the spin has to be bounded by two. However, in a supersymmetric theory, the spin is related to the spectrum of the R symmetry in the ground states of this singly bound string. This is the usual relation between the, the, the uh, R symmetry on the one hand, the spin on the other hand, and the central charge. So, so from the relation between R symmetry and the spin, you learn that the maximum spin that the ground states will have is two times kappa. But uh, this, since the spin cannot be more than two, because you, you cannot get any spin more than graviton, you learn that kappa is less than or equal to one. But we had already argued that kappa is bigger than or equal to one, and therefore this implies that kappa has to be exactly one. This implies that the central charge, uh, the extra central charge of the left mover, so, so this implies that the right mover has no extra central charge, and the left mover has central charge, uh, the extra one is 26 minus d. Now, if you have any current algebra, it better live on the left mover side, and therefore the rank of it is going to be bounded by 26 minus d. So therefore, we learned that, um, we learned that the rank of the group is less than or equal to 26 minus d. This, uh, I forgot to mention that you can, uh, the supersymmetry also implies that this coefficient b is not zero. Even though uh, I didn't say it, it's necessary to argue it because in other words, the current algebra should show up on the current, as a current algebra on the, on the string, and therefore this implies a bound on the rank of the group being less than or equal to 26 minus d, which is, um, which is what, we, what we had uh, anticipated from uh, string constructions. So, so this was for the case of the 0, 0,8 supersymmetry, which is a generic case, but sometimes in the infrared, you can get enhanced supersymmetries and it could enhance to 8,8. In that case, you can, one can show that the rank is bounded even by a smaller number, by 10 minus d, and we get therefore the upper, upper bound of the rank uh, in both cases uh, is, such, is, is the higher one is coming from 0, 0,8 case. So the rank of the group in any dimension d for n equals to, uh, for theories with 16 supercharges is bounded by 26 minus d. And for example, in d equals to four, we learned the, that the rank of the group is bounded by 22. So for example, in four dimensions, uh, N equals to four supersymmetric gang modes with gauge group SU24 is in the swampland. A beautiful theory, N equals to four SU, and we know it's a fantastic theory, but it doesn't mean you can couple it to gravity. So in the context of a holography and ADS CFD, the way we get SU and N equals to four is on the defect in a higher dimensional theory. And so we don't get the SU, for example, N coupled to, in four dimensions, coupled to N equals to four super gravity in four dimensions about the 10 dimensional gravity. So this says that you cannot couple n equals to four SU n supergravity like SU24 to 4D n equals to four supergravity. SU23, uh, which is just the one allowed by this case, is, is actually constructible via an Orion compactification of hydraulic string as was shown by an Orion. So, so indeed, uh, we come to the question of what is actually realized, constructed in string theory, and sorry, uh, we... Sorry, uh, can, I, can I interrupt? Is this understood in SU24, which among these assumptions are violated? Like, um, is there no completeness for spectrum, or is there... The violation comes from the duality conjecture, so th this condition that uh, came from here. The extra central charge should be 26 minus D, and there cannot be such a string. They cannot be a string which gives you the rank bigger than 26 minus d. And if it did, you get a non-unitary theory. So it's a combination. We are using unitarity. We are using that kappa is one. So a number of things I'm using. So unitarity and the distance conjecture combined imply that it cannot be realized. And it's indeed consistent with the fact that, and completeness also. Completeness, unitarity, and distance, all three. We are using all three to get this statement. So anyhow, so the SU23 can be constructed and that's what was done by Narayan. Uh, so what is actually constructed in string theory? Well, indeed, as I said, if, if you, here we are showing the table of what is constructed. 
The green ones are the ones which uh, are the rank of the groups that are constructed in string theory. D denotes the dimension of the space. So in nine dimensions, eight and seven, we are denoting what, we are, what, is, the, uh, what is the rank of the string landscape. As you can see, the upper bound in, uh, is uh, 17, 18, and 19 in dimensions nine and eight, seven. And this is indeed uh, the rank I was telling you about already, 26 minus D. So the rank goes up, uh, the upper rank goes up after dimension comes down. Um, but you see that uh, it is not true that all the ranks less than 26 minus D is realized in string theory. As you can see, uh, there's a sparse data, there's a sparse amount of ranks that are, can be realized, like, denoted by these green boxes. Uh, the yellow ones that we have denoted here are the ones which are allowed by, uh, by anomaly cancellation. So in nine dimensions, there's an anomaly, mod to anomaly, which says that the, the rank of the gauge group should be one, uh, one mod, two, uh, one mod uh, two. So therefore, all the odd numbers in principle could have been realized, but we don't get any other ones other than one, nine, and 17. And uh, the, the, the case one and nine correspond to, the case, case one corresponds to compactivation of M theory on, more, on the Klein bottle, and the R equals to nine corresponds to the CHL string, for example. Uh, similarly, in dimension eight, we have the ranks two, 10, and 18, and dimension seven, we have some funny ranks that have been realized, three, five, seven, 11, and 19, and we wanna see if we can have a way to explain uh, this extra structure. And so to do that, I will turn over uh, the presentation to my colleague, Miguel. So I stop sharing and I'll let Miguel take over. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay, you, you see my slides, right? Yes. Okay, good. So before I go on, any 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 more questions for Coral? That uh, uh, any more urgent questions? Okay. Well, and well, I would like to start by thanking uh, uh, the organizers for the invitation again uh, to present our work here. And well, as Kurman was saying, the, um, uh, what we want to do next is, is understand, it's, it's try to understand as precisely as possible the pattern of allowed ranks of the gauge group that you can have in nine, eight, and seven dimensions, right? So this is the, this is the table that Kurman just beautifully explained. And there's, a, there's an upper bound uh, on the rank, as, as, as he just explained, coming from the BPS strings. And uh, and there's there, but even though even even after taking this bound into account, there are many things that we don't know how to realize in uh, in 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 in, in non-string compactification. So there are several possibilities here. It could be that string theory is not the complete quantum theory of gravity. Uh, it's not un it's it's not the only quantum theory of gravity, and perhaps some of the values of the rank here are realized by some other theory. It could be that there are some string compactifications that we don't know of that realize these values of the rank, or it could be that they are actually inconsistent. And it, it, at least in nine and eight dimensions, it turns out that this last possibility is actually what happens. And uh, for, for us to argue that this is what happens, we need, to, we need to, for us to argue that the only allowed ranks are the ones that can be realized in string theory, we basically need to explain uh, in eight and nine dimensions this modulo eight periodicity that I highlighted here. So the allowed values of the rank that you can realize in eight and nine dimensions, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are shifted by, they are shifted by eight. So this, if, if we are able to explain that such shift is a necessity, we will have realized the string lampos principle. Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing here. It's, do you guys, do you guys see the, this, this, this bar on the, on the bottom? Because that's not supposed to be there. Uh, we can see it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, well, it's just, it, it might. Uh, mm, yeah, okay. I, th I, I think it won't, it won't bother us. Okay. So the idea is we, will, we want to explain the modulo periodicity in eight dimensions and nine dimensions. And we'll be doing it uh, using uh, a different uh, swamp and conjecture that Kurm has mentioned briefly but uh, hasn't used in detail, which is the Cobaldism conjecture. And this will also allow us to partly, partially explain the pattern in seven dimensions, okay? 
So the plan of the, uh, of the rest of the talk is I will first explain what the coordination conjecture is and, um, and how can it be applied. And the basic feature, the nice thing that the coordination conjecture gives you is it gives you extra objects that you can use to, uh, to construct compactifications, which can further constrain the theory. In the particular case of, uh, of interest here, the objects that will be predicted by the coordination conjecture involve a reflection of some coordinates. So we call them I-folds for inversion folds. They're just a generalization of oriented folds and orbifolds. Okay, so this allows us to constrain the ranking nine, eight, and seven dimensions, and also the gauge group. Uh, so that's the idea. Um, Sorry, yeah. uh, before before you go ahead, just a basic question: What were the red boxes I missed? Oh yes, good. So here we have so red boxes are things which are we know are inconsistent, and there's this checkerboard pattern, as Kumru mentioned, because there's a global gravitational anomaly in eight and nine dimensions. In eight and nine dimensions, you cannot have a number of Majorana fermions, uh, which is odd. And with these values of the rank, taking into account also the Fermi's in the gravity multiple, it turns out you get a gravitational anomaly. Thank you. Good. So this question was very good because the point I was wanted, I wanted to emphasize just now is that you should interrupt me at any point. Feel free to interrupt me at any point with any question. It's I don't I don't see your face. I don't I, I don't see uh, um, if the message is getting across or not. So please uh, uh, interrupt me at any point with any question or comment. Okay. So. What is the Cobotism conjecture? The, the Cobotism conjecture is actually, it stems out of what you could say is the uh, oldest Swamblan constraint. Uh, it is the idea that in quantum gravity, we expect there are no global symmetries. This is a statement which is it's old. You, you can find in, in, uh, in the, you, you can find references to it in the string theory literature, you know, from the, from the 80s and the 90s. And apparently I've been told that it's as old as Wheeler in the 50s. Apparently Wheeler in the 50s already uh, uh, proposed this. Um, regardless of who, of who proposed it first, the fact is that we have a lot of evidence for it. Uh, it's true in every string compactification. We have a proof in perturbative string theory, and more recently, we got an argument for it coming from ADS-CFT. Uh, so it's also true in holographic theories. So we expect there are no global symmetries. And the competition conjecture is, in a sense, just a particularization of this statement to a particular kind of topological symmetries that one can construct in theories of gravity which I am uh, going to be describing uh, next. OK, so what is a topological symmetry? Well, we are used to topological symmetries already in field theory. The point is that there are some symmetries which have currents that you can get uh, from the Lagrangian with another procedure. But there are also some charges which do not obviously come from any from, from another procedure, like, for instance, uh, uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic charge, monopole charge. So, uh, there are charges which are conserved just because the the they are the, the they the, you, one can prove explicitly they are invariant on the small deformations. Uh, so, for instance, monopole charge is conserved because the periods of f are quantized and cannot change smoothly. So this is kind of uh, this is an example of what I would call a topological symmetry in field theory. And these ones must also be broken or case in gravity. And the point of the Cobaltism conjecture is that if you're trying to look at topological symmetry in theories of gravity, there are more general things than this that one can do. So to illustrate this example, let me just uh, consider a five-dimensional theory of gravity. Could be any theory of gravity compact, uh, in five dimensions, your favorite string compactification to five dimensions. And let's just consider a t equals zero slice. So this is a four-dimensional space. And if it was with field theory, all that we could consider here was, you know, particles and waves moving on, on this flat background. But because it's gravity, we are allowed to introduce topology change. So in particular, we can do something like this. We can just take a K3, cut it a small ball, and glue it to the non-compact space, like this. From the point of view of an observer sitting here, this just looks like a particle. Just, it's just looking like some other object, some other particle. And the important thing is that uh, the, this particle actually carries a topological charge, very similar to monopole charge, because uh, it turns out that the, this, this integral of the trace of the curvature squared is the, the integral of the first pondering class on K3. It's actually a topological invariant. It seems to depend on the metric, but it's actually invariant on the small deformations. So it's something uh, which, is, uh, which, which is conserved in the small deformations. So it seems like there's a topological charge in, in, in this theory of gravity. And because there's no gauge field for it, 
it seems uh, it seems it's global. The argument is uh, it's not quite yet complete because, well, as we just discussed, in gravity we also expect to have topology change and transitions. So maybe the K3 can grow a leg like this and reconnect back to itself to transition to a different manifold. So any conserved charge that you want to that that you you would have in a theory of gravity should better be invariant under a process like this, right? So it's not enough that it's topolo that, that that the that the charge is invariant under topology change. There's a stronger notion which is required, and the stronger notion that is required is that conserved charges uh, in 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 a semi-classical theory of gravity must be both decent invariants. Okay, so here I drew again the transition that I was drawing before from K3 to this other manifold M4. And the sequence of reconnections and so on has been, is represented he, here by some manifold B5. So this topology change in transitions can equally be described as saying that K3 and whatever manifold K3 transitions to are uh, both, they're both of them together the boundary of a five dimensional manifold P5, okay? And indeed, uh, so this, this, kind of, this kind of construction is called a bordism. Two manifolds which are related by this construction are said to be on the same bordism class. You partition manifolds into equivalence classes and this is the equivalence relation. And the important thing is that the charge that we were discussing before, the pondering charge, is actually a bordism invariant. So it's a well-defined charge even after you take into account topology change in transition. Any questions here? Okay, so this is the so this is this is actually the 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 proper framework to understand conserved charges in, in theories of gravity. The set of all these equivalence classes of Bordisians they actually form a group, uh, the Bordisian group, um, uh, and uh, and uh, the natural invariant, the natural charge in 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 a theory of gravity is the Bordisian group itself, the Bordisian class it cannot be. It cannot be altered by this kind of transitions. There are there's more than one Bordisian group, and which Bordisian group you need to look at depends on the theory that you're considering. So, for instance, if your theory contains gauge fields, you would like the gauge fields here to extend to the Bordisian in a smooth way, and so on. So, those are uh, equivariant Bordisian groups. The the theory that in, in the five D theory of gravity that we were considering, if we want the theory to have fermion somehow, if we want the theory to include the, um, if we want the theory to include fermions, then it better be the case that the manifolds and the bordism carry a valid spin structure. And uh, for instance, the uh, in such a case, the the relevant bordism group would be the four dimensional spin bordism group, which is Z, and the bordism class is precisely measured by P one. Okay. As I said, there are more possibilities. Uh, for instance, uh, you could have gauge fields. Another thing that could happen is that your theory makes sense on non-orientable manifolds. So if your theory makes sense in orientable manifolds, you should, uh, you should uh, and it has fermions, you should consider uh, more exotic borders and groups where the, where the well, for instance, there's the, the two-dimensional pin minus borders and group is a discrete group, but it, the logic is the same. There's still a global conserved charge, okay? So, bottom line, in a semi-classical theory of gravity, because you have topology change in transitions, the natural notion of, there's a natural global charge, which is given by these borders and groups, but there are no global symmetries in quantum gravity. So, the borders and conjecture tells us that at the fundamental level in ultraviolet, the borders and group actually has to vanish, okay? But how does this happen uh, exactly? Well, if the Bordesian group vanishes, so that means that, for instance, if we have this K3, uh, it has a global charge, we want this global charge to disappear, we want to have some sort of transition in the theory that allows us to, uh, to, to shrink the K3 to a point, to, to, to have this, decay, this particle decay into the vacuum. And the whole point of what I've been discussing for the past five minutes is that you cannot do it in the, low energy supergravity with a smooth bordism. 
But nobody said that you cannot do it with perhaps some sort of singular configuration, which is not part of the lowering effective field theory, but it's a valid configuration in the in the in the quantum in the in the full UV quantum theory of gravity. Uh, sorry, sorry, question. Yes. Um, your your dis discussion of whether something could change in um, in a in another direction was a Euclidean discussion. Does it extend to uh, changing in time? Um, uh, yes. So this 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 applies to this applies to space time uh, to space time as well. Yes. So the the more natural discussion of global charges happens at a constant t equals zero slice. So I was not I was doing t equals zero, right? And then discussing possible transitions in that, that, that change the topology, but this typically also happen in time. So that when they happen dynamically, they will involve time as well. But, 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 but your statements about whether, you know, I, I thought your notions of whether something was cobordism equivalent to something else was a Euclidean notion. Or is that more, is that more than a Euclidean notion? So this, so this is, a, so the, yes, so the, the notion that I was, the, the notion that I was discussing is Euclidean motion. It's, uh, it's Euclidean. I was working at the t equals zero slides. Uh, but more, more generally, so you, you, would, you would actually expect it to hold also involving uh, time in the, in, well, so the point is that here I was excluding time. You could also consider borders and groups in the Euclidean theory, including the time direction. So if you have a, in this case, I have a five dimensional theory of gravity. So you could consider the five dimensional borders and group as well. And those, those, those would correspond to what people call a minus one form, uh, uh, global symmetry. So the point is that the charge, the, the borders and charge that I was considering here is, 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 is localized. Uh, if, you, if you try to, and depending on the dimension of the cobordism group that you're considering, the objects, the manifolds that you are looking at are naturally particles or strings or domain walls. Uh, if you want to take into account the whole space time, that's uh, a slightly singular case, but it's, I, think it's, I think it's also worth thinking about. Yeah. So I think probably just to answer, perhaps I would say that one expects the cobordism to be trivial in both senses. The Lorentz one is easier to justify based on conservation of charge, but we expect to be true in both senses. If if the if if in fact the senses are different, which is unclear. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the the. Um... The, the, the idea, that what the cobordism conjecture tells you is that there must indeed be some sort of UV configuration in the theory, which allows this K3 to shrink to a point. So this is typically going to be some sort of UV brain or, or, or whatever. Uh, it allows the, the, the object to decay. So in other words, the cobordism conjecture, what it does for you, in, if you're given a low energy effective field theory or low energy Lagrangian, it tells you that on top of whatever you have in the IR, you must have certain defects. It predicts the existence of certain UV defects that can uh, that 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 must be there in the theory. These guys. And the, the the reason why this is so exciting is that these defects, in general, they could potentially have an anomaly. We don't know what the the cobordism conjecture doesn't tell us anything about why is the word volume theory there, um, uh, but it could potentially have an anomaly. So. Now I, I come to the to the main idea. If there's just like a if there's a if there's a one slide that you need this this one take home message from this part of the talk is it's in this slide. This is the general idea that you can apply to your favorite theory as well. The idea is that if the cobordism conjecture predicts an object which turns out to have an anomaly, and you cannot cancel the anomaly one way or another, then the theory it must be in the swamp line. You coordinate yourself into an inconsistency in the theory must be in the swamp line. And so we're going to be using this to, co to get constraints on theories with 16 supercharges in, in, in supersymmetric theories in D bigger than six. So and in particular, we're going to be able to explain the run. Yes? Uh, this defect, what kind of, uh, what kind of co-dimension is this defect? So the, the, the co-dimension of the defect depends on the co-dimension of the co group that you're looking at. So uh, in the in the example that I was that I was discussing before, the K three, this guy would be uh, this, this would be called dimension five. It would be an instanton, right? If you could imagine, there's the you, if you imagine the K three as a particle, there's a word line of the particle and it ends in some sort of instanton. Uh, the the I'm going to be discussing some other board groups now, and in those cases, this will be a higher dimensional brain. I see. Because okay, yeah. could you also say the logic on this slide a little bit again? Uh, I didn't quite understand uh, this, uh, how we are uh, concluding. Because I thought 
the uh, vanishing of the cobordism charge was predicting this anomalous object and then uh, sorry i just didn't quite understand this uh, sorry yes sorry so the point is that suppose that the cobordism conjecture you need to introduce some object and this object has uh, some more volume degrees of freedom and you can somehow establish that there is an actual gauge anomaly in in this object maybe the the cobordism conjecture together with other considerations as uh, i will be describing later uh, leads to you to conclude that the theory has a gauge anomaly. So the theory is inconsistent. So the, 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 theory, so the, the theory you started with had to be inconsistent. Okay. So that, that, that's basically it. Yeah. So the, the, the basic application of this is we will start imagining we have a theory in nine dimensions with rank uh, three, for instance, run these arguments and the composition conjecture will tell you will tell you you have anomalous objects which will be an inconsistency therefore the theory the theory is inconsistent that's why we don't accept it hello can i can i ask a I, question yes so i wanted to understand in this cobordism conjecture what is the constraints on this starting point the analog of k3 like should it actually be a solution of the theory like, oh no this right so this is, this is it. The, the only requirement is that this object has finite action. In, in this particular case, because it's an instanton, in the higher dimensional cases, we will require that it has finite mass. Like, like okay. for example, can I take a geometry with a lots and lots of flux, but without any back reaction of the flux? Yes. Right? I mean, well, like, yes. Know. So, this is, this, 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 these considerations are about conserved charges, which are inherently topological. So, they also work off shell. So, you could just pull whatever flux you want, those all the equations of motion and still run these arguments. Arguments about anomalies, about global charges, they don't require you to solve the equations of motion. Of course, if you want to find out exactly actually what happens when you physically put the situation, that's a whole other business. Okay, so and, 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 and would you demand that the starting points be uh, somehow smooth, that you don't have singularities in the- That's right. Point? That's uh, I mean, I'm just trying to understand what are the, what are the, what are the conditions that you put on the, on the starting point. So the cobordism classes that you can study, it, it depends on how much you know about the theory, but typically you just know the low energy Lagrangian. So then you say, okay, I'm gonna focus on configurations that I can understand from the low energy point of view. So smooth and whatever. And then the cobordism conjecture tells you, ah, there's gonna be an additional object. Okay. Which is singular. And then that makes things interesting. Okay, so, so, so the question, so if you understood your answer right, it, it's about, whether we know some things are allowed or not. It depends on our, to some extent, on our knowledge of our theory also. Yes, yes. And the minimal thing that one does is just take the lower energy Lagrangian and whatever is okay with it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So, um, as Kurun was explaining before, uh, with minimum supersymmetry in, 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 in nine, in 10 to seven dimensions, we have a lot of supercharges. There are just two multiplets. There's one gravity multiplet, and on a generic point on the Coulomb branch, there's just the only piece of data is a number of multiplets, so that's the rank of the gauge group. And the interactions are completely fixed by supersymmetry, all right? So this is all we need to explain. So this is the same figure that we were seeing before. Um, so Kumru already mentioned, so the, the, the things that we can get from string theory are just, uh, I think Kumru already mentioned the possibilities, they are just, in nine and eight dimensions, there's just three possibilities. They're all dimensional reactions of each other, and they are either heterotic on a circle or a torus, a CHL string, which is basically heterotic with a Wilson line, and an asymmetric orbifold of type 2b, or M theory on, on the, sorry, here says small history should say Klein bottle. And in seven dimensions, there's more possibilities, and most of them, most of the seven dimensional landscape was exploring this paper, uh, where you introduce a triple of, of, of fluxes and, and in, oh, a, tr a triple of Wilson lines on the on the T three. Okay. So, how do we explain this moduloid pattern? Well, we cannot get anything if we don't put anything in. So we're gonna have to make an assumption. So now I'm gonna give you three facts and an assumption supported by the facts. Okay. So fact number one. In nine, seven, and also in, in, in nine, eight, and seven dimensions, the supergravity Lagrangians, they have a parity symmetry in the Coulomb branch. You can just, it just reflects the vectors and leaves the scalars invariant, and that's a symmetry of the lower energy effective Lagrange. The symmetry also extends to the fermions, but 
it can only extend to the fermions uh, in a way in which uh, it's uh, in which it squares to minus one. So that's an example of what people call a pin minus structure. So a, a parity symmetry could square to plus one or minus one. And this is the only possibility compatible with supersymmetry is minus one. So fact number three, the fact that you have a symmetry in the supergravity Lagrangian doesn't mean that you have a symmetry in the full theory. Um, but, uh, but in fact, this is actually, this is, this is the case in all the string compactifications that we just listed. This, this, the symmetry of the Lorentzian Lagrangian up leads to a full symmetry of the theory. Um, the, 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 and you, you can actually check this explicitly because the point is that in these theories, the reflection symmetry is combined with an internal reflection to produce a rotation in a 10 dimensional or 11 dimensional perspective. And fact number four, if the symmetry is exact in a theory of gravity, that means that I am allowed to consistently put the theory on non-orientable manifolds, okay? So, based on these four facts, we're gonna make an assumption, which is that every n equals one theory in seven, eight, and nine dimensions makes sense on non-orientable manifolds, okay? In non-orientable manifolds of the pin minus type. So, this is, uh, at the level of our, of, of, of our work here, this is an assumption. We, we were not able to prove it. We don't know of an example of a theory with 16 supercharges, which doesn't turn out to be parity symmetric. So maybe just follow from supersymmetry. Uh, there's another possibility, which is all the data that one needs to specify uh, a theory with 16 supercharges is basically the Narayan charge lattice. And from that point of view, it's pretty reasonable to think that symmetries of the charge lattice are actually symmetries of the full theory. And if you take that point of view, then this follows along with a lot of similar symmetries. Um, um, but at the point, but, uh, but, but, uh, but the, uh, for this talk, I will just be taking it as an assumption. So any questions here? Okay. So once we have this assumption, then it's just following the logical consequences of our assumption. I'm sorry, uh, just, just uh, one question. So when you say yes. non-orientable manifolds, do you mean like Euclidean space-time, which is non-orientable, or just the spatial slice, which is non-orientable, or? So in this in the, in this case, right. So here, right. So no, no. so when, when you have the uh, symmetry of the, of the p minus type, it's the whole theory that can be put on orientable manifolds. The so whole the, 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 the whole theory makes sense. It's the Euclidean version of the theory. So it's the Euclidean space-time, which is which can be non. -orientable. Yes, yes, that's right. But uh, yeah. Okay, so. If the theory makes sense on p minus manifolds, then we can put it on uh, on on a particular non-orientable manifold, uh, which is RP two. It's a real projective plane. Now, RP two is related to one of the borders and groups that I was describing before. In fact, it's the generator of omega two p minus, which is a Z eight. Okay, so. The, the, the Cobaltism conjecture tells you that you need to introduce some defects so that, the, so that, the, so that these Cobaltism classes are killed. And because RP2 is a two-dimensional manifold, the, the Cobaltism that kills it must have one dimension more. So that means that locally, the Cobaltism conjecture requires the existence of defects that look like R3 over Z2, okay? So they look like orifolds, they look like orientifolds. And in fact, that's what they are in examples. When you try and run this argument in heterotic or in CHL, you get, oh, it's just an orbital. Oh, it's just an orientifold. The point of this is that they have to be true generally. They, they exist generally. And we call these guys I-folds. Okay? Sorry. So uh, the sorry, I-folds are, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so uh, by putting it on RP2, you mean RP2 times some RN? Is that? That's right. That's right. Indeed. Indeed. I'm having, a, exactly. I'm just having an RN for uh, going along for the right. Yes. So the, the K3 that I was talking about was, was a particle in five dimensions. In this, in the, in, in this case, the, the RP2 would be, uh, uh, would be a two-dimensional object that needs to be killed by a three-dimensional object, okay? Sorry, it would be a co-dimension two object which is killed by a co-dimension three object. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we call these guys I-folds. And- the way you're, Sorry. The way you yeah. are reducing the existence of this type of defect is just that the base of the cone is RP2. So, sorry, I didn't quite hear. Based on the base of this cone is the RP2, right? That's how yes, you yes. want to say that's, 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 Yeah, that's, that's where we are saying. Defect is the point at the tip of the cone. 
Okay. Exactly. It's whatever is there. I don't know what is there. That's part. It's outside of the of the of the theory. Uh, but uh, okay. you know, it's singular. But whatever. Uh, we will see that even though it's singular, we can say some things about it. Okay. So if you have i false, that means that it's consistent to compactify. Let's say let's let, let's do the argument for the nine-dimensional theories, and then we'll discuss eight-dimensional and seven-dimensional theories later. So if in nine dimensions I have i folds, that means that I can compactify the nine-d theory on this thing, on the on the orbifold of the torus, where I have basically eight fixed points, and that means eight i folds compactifications. Now, all these eight fixed points, they are the same. They 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 look exactly the same. So whatever whatever contribution they have to effective theory is going to be the same. There is some subtlety involved in tadpole cancellation, uh, which I will be discussing shortly, uh, but let me ignore it for the moment. The point is that if you take the 9D theory and compactify on this background, you get a 6D theory. And this 6D theory is, uh, at the supergravity level, is supersymmetric because compactification here preserves, uh, preserves uh, eight supercharges. So this, this looks like a 6D 1,0 model on the supergravity sector. It might be that the i faults are non-supersymmetric. There, there, there was no part of the argument that told you that these objects had to be supersymmetric. Uh, so it, the, the, the whole compactification might actually be broken by the i faults. Uh, the, the supersymmetry might be broken by the i faults. But regardless of this, there will be anomalies to cancel. So theories in six dimensions, they have gravitation, they have, they have very st strong uh, anomaly cancellation conditions. And in a situation like this, where the supersymmetry is broken only by localized objects, you can still use the supersymmetric version of the gravitational anomaly cancellation condition. The only thing that changes is that there's an effective number of hypers coming from the fixed points, which could be negative because they break supersymmetry. But long story short, you, you need to impose gravitational anomaly cancellation in six, in, in six dimensions for the Eiffel compactification. And the point is that because we have eight fixed points, eight Eiffel fixed points, and each fixed point contributes the same, the total number of tensors coming from the Eiffels is gonna be a multiple of eight, the total number of hypers coming from the Eiffel is gonna be a multiple of eight, and the same for the total number of vectors. And when you plug this into this equation, taking into account that the number of hypers, there's R hypers, where R is the rank of the gauge group, so we just took here a random 90 theory without constraining the rank of the gauge group. If we, uh, if, if we plug this back in into the anomaly cancellation condition, we get that in order to have a solution, the rank has to be one modulo eight, which is precisely the periodicity that you observe in string compactification. So any questions here? Okay, so there is, uh, a subtlety that I that I left for the for the for the for the next slide, which is when I was making this Eiffel compactification and putting all the you know all eight Eiffels in the in the torus, uh, there is a possibility that the, that you need to add extra objects to cancel some sort of tadpole. In fact, the Eiffel has the right dimension to carry magnetic charge under the nine D gauge fields, so there could be a tadpole for the magnetic charge of the nine D gauge fields. And um, and you need to cancel the ta this tadpole. And if the if the if the charge of the Eiffels is an integer, then the argument still works because you just need to add eight fundamental monopoles to cancel the tadpole, and that's 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 not going to affect the fact that it's a multiple of eight. But if the charge of the Eiffel was not an integer, for instance, if it was one eighth, then we we'll one only need one magnetic monopole to cancel the tadpole, and that would lead to an inconsistency. Uh, well, that would that would that would spoil the argument that we had before. Um, so one needs to work out what is the charge quantization condition for the Eiffel, and this can be determined from Dirac quantization. There's a generalization of the Dirac quantization argument for objects like orientifolds and orbifolds that do not have a sphere as an angular geometry. The Eiffel actually has an RP2. Um, so you would you would take into account. Um, uh, so when to to when you have this this part this uh, this kind of situation, there can be additional contributions to the parity anomaly, to, to the to the Dirac phase coming from the parity anomaly of world volume fermions of the electrically probed particle that you use to run the Dirac quantization argument. And in this particular case, the shift is uh, the the shift of a single world volume Majorana fermion would be one eighth. Um, 
so in principle, the bottom line of this is that it could be that the charge of the Eiffel would be, um, instead of an integer, would be shifted by a multiple of one over eight. But in practice, this doesn't happen because the because of supersymmetry. We are looking at a theory with 16 supercharges. So the world volume of the electrically charged particle will contain eight or 16 Goldstinos. So taking all of this into account, the parity, the contribution of these guys is just eight or 16 times one eighth, which means it's an integer. So in the end, running the Dirac quantization argument carefully tells you that the Eiffel has an integer charge, okay? And therefore, this kind of loophole cannot happen. Yes? So here you are assuming that supersymmetric Eiffel? No, I'm assuming the theory is supersymmetric. I'm assuming that the background is supersymmetric. So the supersymmetry has to be realized that the, uh, the supercharges have to be realized at the, at the, at the level of the, uh, in the word volume of the electric probe particle that you use to go around the Eiffel and assume charge quantization. So it's just the, the only thing that matters for this, it's not whether the Eiffel is supersymmetric or not. It's, I, I can consider the electric probe particle far away from the Eiffel, and then I ask, how many world volume fermions does it have? And because it's, because it's breaking either six, eight or 16 supercharges, it's gonna have either or 16 fermions. So that gets rid of the, of the problem. Okay, and you can also run this argument for higher dimensional brains, and it predicts the correct charge condition condition. So uh, let me quickly mention uh, an example of this. Um, um, and ex because I'm, we're talking abstractly about how these Eiffel backgrounds should exist, but they should also exist in particular. Uh, if, if they exist generally, they should in particular exist in, in, in non-string compactifications. So for instance, let's look type one uh, to compactify to nine dimensions. There should be an Eiffel. And the Eiffel, as we said, looks like this. But this is the nine dimensional geometry. Uh, so that suggests that in 10 dimensions, the Eiffel should be a pair of O5 planes. So this geometry quotiented by a C2, uh, with this Z2 quotient, so that it has a pair of fixed points. If that is the case, the full Eiffel background is just a C, it's, a K, it's an or, basically an orbital K3 with O5 planes. So it's the kind of compactification that we are very familiar with. There's one subtlety, we need to figure out which O plane we need to put, uh, which, which ones do we put? O5 plus, O5 minus? There are, there's actually four planes of O planes, uh, four types of O planes in type one. And it turns out that the only possible consistent possibility is the O5 plus. The O5 plus has positive Ramon Ramon charge. So that means that one needs to introduce anti D5 brains to cancel the tadpole. You introduce eight of them, as we were discussing, but they are non supersymmetric. They configure it. it. This makes the whole compactification non supersymmetric. So, nothing in the coordination conjecture told, told you that the compactification canceling tadpoles involved with Eiffels had to be supersymmetric. And in fact, here we see that it is not the case. Uh, and it can, but the anomalies, uh, the, the, the anomalies still cancel as they should. It also tells you it, there's also no reason why it should not be supersymmetric. So, in fact, for the rank one theories, the Eiffel turns out to be supersymmetric, okay? So it really uh, varies from, uh, we, we, have, we have both possibilities, supersymmetric or non-supersymmetric Eiffels realized. And I think it's interesting, it's very interesting that you use consistency conditions of a non-supersymmetric compactification to put a constraint on the rank of a supersymmetric theory, okay? So there's a similar story in, 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 in eight dimensions, we compactify, um, uh, we, we, can, we can start with, uh, with an 8D theory with rank R and compactify on the Eiffel background. This time we get a 5D theory. 5D theories do not have parity anomalies. So they don't, they don't have local anomalies, but they have a modulo 16 parity anomaly. And the Eiffels, again, contribute a multiple of eight to this anomaly. The supergravity fields contribute just the right amount so as to again get the correct uh, con the, the correct uh, values of the rank in eight dimensions. There's a subtlety here which I can talk more about if you guys are interested, because there is a possibility that this anomaly might be partially cancelled by a topological Green Schwartz mechanism. We were not able to exclude this possibility, but we also didn't. Uh, uh, we also haven't established that, that it happens. Okay, Any questions here.
Okay, so we can keep on running the argument. And in seven dimensions, the best that we can do is an Eiffel compactification on S1 over Z2, which tells us that the rank is one modulo two. So unfortunately, that doesn't explain the pattern uh, of, 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 of the ranking 70 theories. Uh, interestingly, the pattern is three plus K, where K is either zero or a power of two. Right now, we don't know if this is something meaningful or it's just a coin. It's just a, uh, so if these powers of two have any meaning or it's just that we haven't fully explored all the landscape of compactifications uh, in seven dimensions. And there might be for the possibilities that end up saturating this, this, this rank. So this is how the, the story looks like now, uh, after taking into account the conditions from the Eiffel. So you see that in eight and nine dimensions, Hello? there's no yellow. Hello? Yes? Yeah, can you just go to the previous slide, please? Yes. So, so these uh, 70 theories uh, that you are enumerating, the observed pattern, they're all known, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what is known, how to construct mainstream theory, yes. So, so do you know, like, um, like if you kind of look into the compactifications exactly, uh, why you have this power of two structure? Is that, or maybe, uh, that may, maybe, may, may, maybe there's, yeah, I don't know. I haven't looked at it in, in detail, so I don't know. Uh, but maybe, maybe, so th these are typically constructed by taking T3 with, uh, with non commuting wheels on lines. So maybe there's a way to understand where this structure is coming from. Okay. We good? Yes. This uh, um, uh, this uh, cobordism, the consequences of the cobordism conjecture. Here, you just explored a particular cobordism group, right? But presumably, yes. there will be many more constraints coming from other types of manifolds and so on. Indeed, uh, exactly. So for example, example, the example of K three that you gave uh, that and some other, you know, any complicated manifold would give you some constraints, right? Unless I'm, um, I mean, if I'm. Yes, yes, in principle, yes. So this, this, so, okay, so there's two ingredients here. You need to have a non-trivial uh, cobordism group and a cobordism defect, and then you also need to get lucky and find an anomalous compactification. So if you want to rule things out in this way, you need to find something which has an anomaly. It could also just happen that you have some, some defects created by the cobordisms and they're just fine, there's no anomaly in there. So there's a little bit of looking around for interesting cases. Okay. But yeah, in principle, any cobordism class is susceptible of being useful for this. Okay. So yeah, that's that's the situation. And now, very very briefly, let me tell you a little bit about what what can we say at points of enhanced gauge symmetry, because this was all in the generic point of modulized space. But at particular points in modulized space. You can actually you you actually can get an uh, you 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 get an enhancement of of the symmetry. The gauge group is no longer u one to the rank, and one question that you could ask is: Okay, what possible Lie algebras can uh, or or semi simple factors can arise? And the question here is only interesting in eight and nine dimensions because in seven dimensions we can get everything. So. In, I just circle in red, the things that we know how to get in string compactification. And I just crossed out some examples that are known to be inconsistent. inconsistent. They have a global gauge anomaly. So you see that there's symplectic groups in nine dimensions and G2 in eight and nine dimensions that we don't know how to get. They are, I just wanted to advertise this, this interesting problem. We don't know how to get them, but they are not forbidden either. Um, and unfortunately, we were looking for Eiffel's that would tell us something about it. We didn't, we didn't find any, but we did find that some Eiffel's, some, the composition conjecture can provide constraints on the global form of the gauge group. So this is just the Lie algebra, but there's also the, 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 the global, the, what, what is the actual gauge group. And by looking at particular Eiffel's in which we combine, it's the same kind of Eiffel's that we were looking at only that instead of just using parity, we use a combination of parity and a gauge transformation. Um, if, if you combine the two and analyze the same kind of constraints that we were looking at, you get tables like this, you, uh, where entries which are shaded in red, we claim are in the swamp land and can never arise at any point in modalized space uh, as part of the gauge group. So for instance, you can have E6 in 90 compactifications as we know, but you cannot have E6 over Z3, okay? So there's, this, this table is also, by the way, is not exhaustive. We would expect that there, there's maybe uh, more constraints that you can, you can study by, by, by looking at, uh, at more general board, uh, cobordisms in eight and nine dimensions. 
And this is an example of a nice story uh, where you have different people working sort of on the same topic from different angles, and we all agree. So there was this recent paper uh, from the PAN group, uh, where, which gets similar constraints on the rank of the gauge group of AD, and, uh, of AD theories uh, by looking at global anomalies, of, of uh, mixed anomalies um, uh, of a different kind of the ones that we look here. And there was also, there's also a recent paper, this paper, which is a list, it's an exhaustive list of all the maximal enhancements of uh, all, all, the, all, the, all the list, all the, the global structure of the gauge group for all the possible maximal enhancements in heterotic in eight and nine dimensions. And it has like 400 entries, so it's impressive. And it's nice that we, we, we all agree with each other. So the constraints that we get here are satisfied in this example and they're consistent with the ones here, okay? So that's, uh, that's, I think, interesting. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, what we've seen is that the, the swampland principle, simple swampland ideas based on the absence of global symmetries, combined with a high amount of supersymmetry in more than six dimensions, are enough to reproduce, it, it, they're enough to reproduce the parts of the observed string landscape. And in particular, they are, um, they are um, in, in, more, in eight and nine dimensions, they allow for a full realization on a generic point of the Coulomb branch of the string Lampos principle. Everything that is consistent according to some principles is just what we, you find from string compatifications. And of course, the natural thing to do here is to try and extend these ideas uh, to less supersymmetry and, and also understand the seven dimensional case. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Professor Bafa and uh, uh, Miguel, so it was a fantastic talk. Maybe we can just unmute my uh, microphone and clap up to show our appreciation. Yes. So now it's time for questions. So if you have any question, please unmute your microphone and carry on. So there are some questions in the chat. So should we start from there? Yeah. Um, yeah, Alok, uh, you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, very sure about the, uh, the status in the math literature, but uh, I'm given to understand that there is, uh, uh, um, there is a theorem, for example, by Conrad and Floyd, uh, which talks about the connection between complex borders and classes and, and K-theory. So I'm curious to know if, uh, the cobordism conjecture has been studied or can be studied from a K theoretic perspective. Thanks. Um, I, th I think that makes sense. Uh, yeah. So, so when, for instance, when you have when you have um, when you have gauge fields, uh, you need to introduce. Uh, so the, the the bordition group also takes those into account. So it also takes into account charges which are measured by fluxes. And we know that charges that are measured by fluxes are more generally measured by, uh, uh, by K-theory. Um, uh, so cobordism is more general than, than K-theory, clearly. So you have, uh, I mean, the conditions on the manifold and all that is, is ignored in K-theory. You start with the manifold and, I mean, a given dimension, you're not considering different classes of manifolds. So it's a different question. But the uh, gauge theoretic aspects are related, clearly. <clears throat> all right, thanks. Can't hear you, Jewel. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm just asking any other questions. Um, maybe I'll just ask uh, one question. Yeah, sure. So, so this is a more uh, somewhat of a meta question about whether there is a qualitative difference between d greater than six and um, and and d and, and d less than or equal to six. At least we know that from a point of view of uh, super conformal field theories, uh, it seems like we can have non trivial super conformal field theories still be equal to six, but not higher. Of course, it's uh, not proven, but, uh, but it seems to be the case. Uh, so, which already says that even consistent quantum field theories are kind of, um, they have slightly different, uh, they're qualitatively different um, set 
uh, in d greater than 6 versus d less than equal to 6 so do you expect that you know like um, in quantum gravity also this will be true and and whether you know like many of these um, conjectures uh, would be quite weak in the less than or equal to 6 uh, it's a big question no, there has been, first of all, uh, related to your first comment, there are, there's, a, of course, a theorem, Nam's theorem, that there is no super conformal field theory in bigger than six dimension. That's just a classification of super conformal yeah. algebras. But uh, to answer your, your main, the main thrust of your question, indeed, uh, dimension six and lower is more interesting because you can have half as much supersymmetry as we have discussed. So eight supercharges is a possibility starting at six dimensions, and that's precisely where you end up getting very interesting objects. Uh, and it's not just because of super conformal symmetry, because super conformal symmetry can ha appear with, with already with 16 supercharges, but already, but the eight supercharges already is uh, some new story there. And uh, people have, including myself, have studied aspects of swamp land conditions on eight supersymmetry charges. And there are restrictions that follow from it. For example, for F theory uh, com compactifications on FTK3, there are some landscape we get in 60 with eight supercharges. And, uh, naively, you might expect to get more based on supergravity consistency, but Swampland rules out a lot, number of them. This was studied in a, in a paper that uh, uh, I mentioned partly in, in my talk by the one we wrote with uh, Gary Shu and Hicho Kim, and another recent paper with, uh, with Hicho Kim and uh, Uri Tarazi and Sheldon Katz. We studied aspects of theories with six supercharges. They are not as, uh, the conditions we have are not as exhaustive as they could be, in lower dimensions, there are much more possibilities that have not been ruled out. So it's going to be harder to deal with those, but actually probably more interesting for exactly that reason. So we'll learn hopefully more lessons about what Swamp Land is to try to manage the landscape that string theory gets and to understand whether what other principles we are missing to fill the gap. And so that's the, that's the exciting part. So I think D equal to six is exactly the kind of an exciting next frontier with theories with eight supercharges. Sorry, just to make sure I understood. So do you think there will be new Swampland uh, principles for the Presumably. Pre I'm, I'm expecting, I, I mean, I, there's not, I mean, it's not obvious, obviously necessary. It might be that we haven't explored the, already the ones we already have carefully enough, uh, but there could also emerge new ideas of Swampland and either way it would be interesting to find out. Okay, thank you. What? I have a question. Is there a way to deduce existence of BPS brains, higher dimensional brains? And if so, can one use anomaly cancellation for those to get additional constraints? Existence of BPS brains? Higher dimensional, not just the strings, but uh, higher dimensional. Oh yeah, in, in principle, you can study the, I mean, the black brain solutions in any dimension in supergravity. So their existence suggests the existence of similar objects in supergravity. Uh, of course, one has to deal with issues of singularities and so on, of gravity solutions and whether we trust the singularities near the horizon and so on. But module that question, I would say that, yes, if you write down a solution for supergravity solutions, you would expect that there is corresponding BPS black brain, like the things we know in the Hawking's uh, accounting of the entropy of black holes or black brains in this case. And then, uh, you know, the way you obtain constraints from the BPS stream, uh, and insisting, you know, requiring anomaly cancellation, uh, would one get additional constraints coming from brains? It could be. Very, it could very well be that there would be more ones, and uh, there's no reason they are not interesting, for sure. We have studied the most, the simplest one here, so it's not by any means the only one we should study. So I agree that an interesting class would, for example, be the five brains in particular, whether they teach us anything. Of course, if you go to high dimension brain, then as a co-dimensional object, it's going to be harder to get them, so therefore you cannot get five brains in a six dimensional theory as objects. So there's gonna be, you cannot have space time filling brains because that will give you problems with anomalies and so on. So, so it would be less, less uh, it's gonna be harder to get them, but with the high, high enough dimensions perhaps. So yes, much of that caveat, but yeah, for example, two brains, three brains, there could be interesting other examples, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, related to that, uh, the so the Eiffel the Eiffels that we get here, they are they are actually so they are they're high dimensional brains. They are supersymmetric. They only become non supersymmetric once you compactify because you need to introduce anti brains to cancel the tadpole. But the object the object itself is supersymmetric, and there's a possibility that the kind of constraints that we get here could also be understood by some sort of inflow of a global anomaly on the volume of the object.
Also, one more question. Uh, uh, the absence of uh, global symmetries in quantum gravity, is this to be expected or is this uh, to be claimed even for uh, discrete symmetries or? Yeah. Yeah, in principle, yes, the, the arguments in ADS CFT, for instance, they work the same for, for discrete symmetries. And we also, the case is weaker. So, for instance, the perturbative proof in the worksheet doesn't apply. But uh, we also don't know counterexamples. Okay. Any other questions? Sorry, uh, this is just one more question. Um, so what about, you know, like if you don't have asymptotically flat space, but if you have like ADS or something where, um, and you're looking at uh, theories there. Um, so for example, you know, like one of the criteria that was used, uh, you know, like in the Tumul's part of talk was about not having more than spin two. Um, but what about if you allow vacillate theories um, and so on and so forth in ADS. Um, is that analyzed or uh, do we know what happens? Well, uh, first of all, there are two questions you asked. First of all, about the, whole, the ADS CFT, ADS case, that um, you could ask what the restriction to Minkowski space, what happens if you, you take it away and take, for example, ADS seven times S4 and things like that in seven dimensions, what is the story with that? Uh, part of the issue with the, A, the ADS case is that uh, and this is actually a, one of the swamp plant conditions also applicable to ADS, is that there is no ADS by itself. That you cannot just get ADS, that you always get ADS times something. Which means that you cannot make the scale of ADS arbitrarily large without some other light degrees of freedom emerging from internal geometries of some kind. So, so one of the conjectures for swamp plant is that pure ADS belongs to the swamp plant. So if you want to talk about ADS, therefore, if you want to take a lot large ADS in particular, uh, then you have to talk about this large extra space. And so typically you decompactify something else. So, so you do not have ADS in the lower dimension really by itself. In some sense, uh, this is related to the fact uh, that, for example, in ADS seven, you have infinitely many uh, cases in string theory. For example, ADS seven times S4 mod out by Zn for arbitrary n. So you would say, wait a second, we have infinitely many supersymmetric theories in seven dimensions. What happened to this finiteness I was talking about? But what happens is that what you have introduced really is that is you have introduced defects in the 11 dimensional theory, not in the seven dimensional theory. So the seven dimension, it looks like you have a seven dimensional theory, but it's, not, it's a misnomer because you cannot have an arbitrary large seven dimensional ADS seven without uh, with, with having the controlled finite size, fixed size internal four dimensional space. So in that sense, you're actually talking about back, you're back to 11 dimensions when discussing that. So one has to, one has to be mindful of that. That's a, so that's the first part of, that's the first uh, answer to the first part of your question, why we were focusing more mainly on Minkowski space, because we have to include this other ingredient for the ADS case. As far as the higher spin theories, of course, one can try to talk about aspects of that. So, so the thing that we used in this talk was the relation to the spin two emerged by saying that there's a dual description for, for the n equals to, uh, for the theories with n equal to 16 supercharges of ordinary type. So we were assuming that you have a, you have a 16 supercharged theories with, six, with the usual Einstein theory as a dual one. You could imagine, I don't know, what would it exactly mean to have a dual theory of this one being a higher spin uh, kind of a theory. That certainly we did not allow or assume. So we assumed that was not in the, in the game, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, I don't think there are no more questions. So thank you very much, Professor Vapa and Miguel. So it was really a pleasure to have you and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, so I wish everyone have a nice time. So bye bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye.